Michigan voters go to the polls this November and CMU Public Broadcasting again brings you Meet the Candidates. The election year series that gives you the chance to meet those seeking state and national office. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas and we are joined this time by Jim Page. He is the Democratic candidate for the 107th uh, House seat of the district that is in northern Michigan. This is an open seat in this year's election. Uh, Mr. Page, thanks very much for joining us. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, we take our first few moments to do as our title indicates to meet the candidates, give you a chance to share some of your background and the experience that you bring to the campaign. Okay, my name is Jim Page and I am First and foremost, a retired teacher from the Sioux Area Public Schools. Uh, I've had 27 years of teaching experience. I uh, retired in 2010. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Marine Corps. I was a sergeant in the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, that's where my background is, is it from the Marine Corps into the, stu to the classroom. I taught uh, basically math and computers for 27 years. Um, from that, also, I'm an avid sportsman, outdoorsman. I like my hunting and fishing and everything. And um, I got interested in politics basically because of the uh, current situation that we have where we're not getting leadership and represent, proper representation, as far as I'm concerned, in our House of Lansing. So I got interested in it and started investigating it. And uh, I've been involved, involved with different campaigns for the last six years. And this year, I just decided that it was time for me to run. For this campaign, then, as you've traveled throughout the, uh, the 107th district, uh, the issues that have come into focus for you and that that the potential voters are telling you that they see as key to this campaign. The different issues that we have is uh, one of them is the retirement tax, the pension tax. Uh, it's been hard on seniors. And we need to probably take care of that or fix it somehow and repeal it. Um, that is one of the issues. The other issue has been the funding of education. We need to steady the education system and fund it so that we don't have what I refer to as yo-yo financing. That's where we go for a period, then cut it, and then restore a little bit at a time. And uh, we go through that. That's one of the areas. And in education, one of the other areas that I really want to emphasize um, is that we need to get to vocational education and careers. We need to have skilled laborers just as much as we do college education, educated people. So we need to diversify our education system a little bit and give opportunities, more opportunities to those that are not going to go to college to get become welders and electricians and other jobs that are skilled trades. There are lawmakers that have been uh, making that push from both sides of the aisle in, in recent years. What, as you see it entering as a candidate in this campaign, needs to be done more to, to create a, a, a workable structure or create more opportunities, expand that area of voc ed? Well, one of the things I think we got to do is we got to give local control back to parents and because some of the, this, right now I think we have a lot of the curriculum that is developed is going into four years of math and four years of English and, and three years of science. I'm not sure on the three years, it might be four. Um, but that, we have to give them options because we gotta give them the career centers and the uh, vocational education time to develop those skills. And besides just in the college prep. Looking at increasing those options then and, and that extends to the other issue you raised was education funding. What in the present funding structure outside of uh, the fluctuation, is there something in the basic structure of how we pay for the funding formula, that base amount per student, how would you address what we have seen as the disparity, one district to the other and, and also as you referred to it, the yo-yo uh, the financing. The, the disparity has, we have standards in there that some, student, some school districts are paid more per student than others. And I'm not gonna say that we should bring them down, but we should move them up. And proposal A that was passed was supposed to have done that, but it has failed to be, be implemented correctly. We need to work on that. As a, as a legislature, we need to come together and work for the common good. 
As a and, former teacher, and, and then probably, I'm sure, talking to teachers, what, what have they identified for that policy in place for as long, what, what, what has been its flaw what, in, in the way it was formulated and in, in its intent? Where has it been, what is fundamentally wrong? How do we fix or replace Proposal A? Well, uh, Proposal A was, was, in it, was created to uh, eventually equalize all students at the same level. All right? And I think the pol politics have gotten in the way, and we haven't gone through and instituted those areas in there because of, of the cost, rather than trying to fund it. Um, there's also been switches that have been made by the legislature where the lottery money that was in there, some of that, that was designated for schools, but then they took some of the money that was already designated schools out of the general budget and took that out. We need to install that back in there and make sure that it gets funded fully the way that it was intended to do. When we look at the issue then of, of how we increase funding, and, and you said the overall uh, budget itself, when we look at the, the implemented uh, pension tax that is now in place, what would be your approach specifically in, in addressing those issues, a reworking of the budget to take care of these concerns that you have? Well, it's going to be a, you're going to have to do the budget and you're going to have to do it with some uh, common sense approach for the common good. Um, you cannot, I don't know the exact figures on the, the budget. That I'm hoping that when I get elected that I will have the budget and we can lay it out there and look at it and figure out where it's at, all right, and how much is coming in. We have to have a fair tax system. The one that puts, doesn't put the burden on the middle class, all of it, doesn't hurt business, all right? It's got to be something that is overall, we all have to come together and agree on a fairer tax system. And I don't know exactly the exact policy that we can do, but we have to come together and work on it. You mentioned uh, the concerns of, of businesses. I'm assuming, obviously, you've talked to a lot of business owners, uh, business people in the district as well. What concerns do they raise, whether it be budget, uh, levels of regulation when it comes to doing business? What do they want addressed for their next representative who goes to Lansing? Uh, most of the businesses are more concerned about the uh, the regulations, and um, I hear them about uh, a lot on the health care and the 29 hours part-time workers and um, that material that goes along with it. And there are some concerns with that. Um, they haven't been speaking out against taxes too much because I think their taxes have been cut a great deal. And I think their business climate is better right now than it ever has been. Where do they see opportunities then potentially to expand what would be uh, is it a matter of the population, the workforce that they have to draw from? What do they see as the challenges that they would like to see in addressing things, especially when we look at districts like this that are in, in a more rural area of the state? One of the biggest areas that I find that they have a hard time with is skilled labor and coming up with workers. Um, I know that uh, we have a couple of factories or a couple of uh, um, uh, uh, factories, I don't know what you want to call them, they're pro they produce items and they're not really a factory, they, they're medical equipment and stuff like that, that they cannot hire or cannot find skilled laborers or skilled workers to come in there and help them out right now. And that's a problem. And I know that the area has been crying for welders because we have welding deficits, we have manufacturing areas that don't have welders. We are also in need of like carpenters and, and other skilled trades and we're lacking in that area. Do they feel that the, the younger uh, workforce that would be coming in then are coming out of school without the proper skills, are leaving the area and not returning to potentially fill those jobs? I mean, you talked about uh, the need to expand vocational education, which clearly would address the issue for uh, the welders and some of the other trades in manufacturing. What about um, even the other uh, STEM-related jobs that might come for, say, uh, manufacturing in a medical supply company? What, what are they telling you is the lack, the, the, the gap that they see between the workforce and them being able to do what they do? Uh, a lot of it has to do with their skills. Their, some of it is math skills in that particular area. Some of it is just not being 
trained to work or having the work skills or work ethics in some areas. And, uh, but it's, it's basically just general skills. And that's not, that's work skills. What are some of the other concerns that they raise uh, for you when it comes to the district uh, economic development, perhaps versus environmental concerns? What are people telling you when you go and, and knock on the doors that they're saying? Well, in environmental concerns is a big issue, um, and I hear that more. They don't get. I don't get into the. Um, positive and negatives of job interaction, but most of them are concerned about the environment. Uh, they, want, they don't want their environment hurt. Uh, there's a lot of people, one of the areas that I hear about is the pipeline under the bridge and the Enbridge pipeline under the bridge. And my policy has been, if they're going to change it, it's, it's 60 years old, if they're going to increase the pressure or run different types of oil into it, then they need to replace that with a double walled uh, pipeline so that it does not have the potential to leak. Uh, right now, if they increased it, it would leak and it would be a devastating to our economy and to our environment. All right, that's a big concern. And most of the people are in favor of the environment. And I've, I've run into that several times. There's a lot of people in there. As far as fracking goes, I'm against the fracking area because of the use of the water and the amount of water that is being used and consumed. Uh, one fracking well may use 20 million gallons of water, all right, which is going to devastate our water table and our water community at some point. And they need, and it's irreplaceable. You just don't take 20 million gallons out and then replace it with something, all right. Uh, that's a concern. But it's been there's been several topics and several concerns on that. In the final 30 seconds that we have, then it, it's the opportunity if you have. Uh, assuming that there is that voter, he or she, getting set to go to the polls, you've got that chance to leave him or her with that final message asking for their vote. What would that message be? Well, the, the big thing that I would want to do is, is I want to work together. I want to get elected leaders that can actually come across there and talk and come up with solutions. And that's where I would really try to do. I would try to work with anybody and everybody to get the common goals and do what's good for everybody in our district and not single out one group or another group. I want to do the common good. And that's very, very important in, our today, in today's society. We need to stop being polarized and start working together to come in together and look at the common good. For that message and, and all the attention spent on uh, the specific issues that you have had in District 107, thanks very much for taking the time to talk with us. We appreciate okay. it. Thank you. And thank you for your time and attention as well here on Meet the Candidates. We've been talking with Jim Page, the Democratic candidate for the 107th district seat in the Michigan House, as we noted an open seat in this year's election. We urge all of you to go out and exercise your right to vote on Tuesday, November 4th. Thank you for joining us for Meet the Candidates. CMU Public Broadcasting invited both major party candidates for this office to participate in this series. Remember to go to the polls on Election Day. Hello and welcome again to this edition of Meet the Candidates. I'm David Nicholas, joined this time by Senator Darwin Boer. He is the Republican Senator for the 35th District seat in the Michigan Senate, uh, elected to that office uh, four years ago and seeking a, a second term to represent the 35th District. Uh, Senator, good to see you and welcome back. Thanks, Dave, and it's nice to be back. Hmm. We give our, uh, all of our candidates a chance in the first few moments for some of that personal information, some news about you, where you're from, and, and the experience that you bring to the campaign. Thank you. Uh, I would start by saying I was born and raised a dairy farmer north of Everett. My roots are there. My grandchildren are seven generations. I went into banking when I was 19 years old and retired 41 years later from banking. In that time, I, when I was 34, I ran for township supervisor. That job was supervisor and assessor. So I was held that position for 28 years uh, until I ran for the House of Representatives. I ran and won and served six years in the House, uh, representing the 102nd District. Uh, then we ran for the 35th Senate District and was fortunate enough to win and served four years there. Looking at the issues you have confronted to date in the first term and that that you're finding on the campaign trail now, what are the voters telling you and, and what is your assessment of the key issues for this campaign? Well, the key issues differ with the different areas of my 
Senate District. If you're over along Leelanau, Benzie, Manistee, Mason counties, which would make up the new district, uh, you're talking about a lot of water issues. You're talking about uh, um, uh, migrant workers um, that you might not hear if you were in the urban centers. Uh, we're talking about education. We're talking about roads. Uh, when you when you get into those, we talk about uh, Wexford County manufacturing. Uh, my biggest center there is in Cadillac uh, on manufacturing, but dairy farming, farming in general, uh, are a lot of the issues that we hear. Tourism certainly always uh, is a big issue to my to my Senate district. We have. We'll have, uh, if we win this, we'll have 12 counties. We'll be tied for the largest Senate district. So we go across the center, coast to coast, uh, from Ludington through to one county short of Lake Huron. So we have a big Senate district and uh, a variety of issues when you're talking about the center part of the state against the western side, against the eastern, Ross Common, Ogama, Crawford. Uh, so. We hear a lot of different, a lot of different issues, but uh, basically, those are generally what we're talking about when we're out in the public. If we look at those issues, first of all, that that are tied more to the the coastlines that involving uh, the Great Lakes, the, the the water system, the ecosystem, and the like, uh, what's the main issue or, or set of issues that you're hearing about, and and what would you then uh, propose to do to to advance uh, those concerns that voters have raised for you? Well, one of the one of the responsibilities that I have, I was uh, elected uh, b uh, to be the co-chair of the Great Lakes Water Caucus, which is eight states and the two provinces out of Canada. So, uh, we just came back from Quebec City, and talking about our water issues. Well, certainly, the carp is we have to fix that problem. Ballast water being dropped in our Great Lakes. You can still do it in Canada uh, or outside of Michigan. So if you drop it in Lake Huron, it still affects us, who you can't do it. And so those are the general issues. Uh, Long-term water use, we talk about that. Making sure we have uh, a good understanding of where our water is and isn't in the state of Michigan. Our demand on water, for agriculture purposes alone uh, is huge. And uh, if we're going to be a leader and continue to be a leader, we got to know where we can and can't uh, uh, draw water to the, the extent that maybe we need it. So those are it. The, uh, the issues and the concerns raised about the roads, the jobs, the, the economic base and, and stability that's in, uh, impacted by the infrastructure and the overall uh, economy, if, if that is one of those that you see across the district, but primarily more into those areas where we've got a lot of those roadways, um, what what do you see as the major uh, things that would need to be done to to further address the concerns that we have about the roads and then that impact on the overall economic phase? Well, all of us know that you've got to have infrastructure first. If you're going to have manufacturing, you're going to have a product that gets in and out of the state of Michigan, where it don't set in the center. We set up in the north corner. We have a large border and, and a great trading partner with Canada. So we have to uh, have our infrastructure up. What I think we have to make sure, though, of that we uh, uh, share that equally. We know the urban areas have uh, a lot of traffic. But those people want to use our portion of the state, too. And so our rural roads in, in uh, and our manufacturers need to get the products in and out, and, our, and uh, we need to have the infrastructure to get the tourism up here and out and have a good experience. So uh, I see those uh, as kind of universal all over the state, but uh, we need to share uh, equally across the state and not all the funds go into one part or the other. Any of those uh, situ uh, scenarios, I guess I should say, for for solving the long-term road funding problem, have you seen uh, enough attention then? I, I'm sensing from what you're saying that, that you have some concerns that not enough is being done to the outstate areas when it comes to we need to spend money on the roads as a whole. Yeah. Is enough money getting to, and, and what would you do to get more money perhaps into the more mid and northern parts of the yeah. state? 
I was appointed to the Infrastructure Committee and the Senate to look at the uh, road issues and come up with a proposal. I looked at 13 different plans for long-term funding for the state of Michigan, 13. And uh, we voted on three of those. Uh, we voted three times to have some solution to, the, to, uh, to road funding and could not pass any of those before we left uh, for the summer to come back and meet with our constituents. So uh, I think that we have to not change Act 51 formula. Um, that gives us in our rural area uh, at least an equal uh, funding source for our, for our northern region. If we change that formula, then I can almost assure you we lose. And so we need to leave the formula alone, in my opinion, um, but the dollars we put in to that need to go out there to those local roads. And uh, I think we could do that. I was part of the, of the budget, and the House did a great job of putting a plan together that the Senate did not uh, uh, approve. But my issue with that particular plan was it was short term. It don't, we have to go back into the budget, and I'm a member of the appropriations. We have to go to the budget and do it every year. And there's a lot of priorities in the budget. So can you get 400 million every year? Can you get 500 million? Or can you get to a billion dollars? Well, uh, that's a tough call without having some other revenue source. And that's why we need to strive for a long-term solution. You mentioned the impact that tourism has across so much of, of your district and, and so many that we see up north. And then and you mentioned the broad issue of jobs. A lot of those are intertwined as we look at the economic recovery moving forward. How, how closely are those knit? Where do you see economic recovery and, and jobs? What proposals would you have to strengthen both the overall jobs front, whether they're tied to tourism or, or certainly emphasizing its place in the economy as well? Yeah. When we talk about in our district, the manufacturing jobs, I'm talking about 4,400 or so in the city or in Cadillac, uh, those are continued to expand in that area. They've done well through even the heart of our times in state. Um, so we'll continue to, uh, to promote manufacturing. But tourism, if we put a dollar in uh, to Pure Michigan, it's giving us back $6.66 now. You've probably read those. Uh, but you can see it in our, in our Senate district, in our resort areas, uh, the differences in the motel uh, occupancy. Um, in the jobs created, I think we're at something they're telling us 200,000 jobs uh, in tourism now, up from 130. Uh, so you can feel that when you're in your communities. Uh, my largest city is 12,000. Uh, everything else is small and rural, uh, so tour tourism is big. We need to continue. We're creating a lot of jobs in agriculture, a lot. And agriculture being a $100 billion industry in our state, I happen to vice chair policy for agriculture in the state. I see that as the greatest chance to increase jobs in our, with that. Aquaculture needs to be developed more in our state. Uh, we need to be able to produce uh, what our restaurants are needing without buying it up from somewhere else or fish. And we have the greatest opportunity anywhere to do that. And so we'll work, continue to work toward that. I think the expansion of, um, of our um, mulching or composting in this state has great potential. We need to get the regulations to it so that people feel safe with it, but why not use all this wasteful product that we're sending and putting into the landfills out and compost it and put it back on our ground and grow food for our people. So a couple of the areas that I really feel strong about that we can create a lot of jobs in, in those two for sure. In the first, uh, the last minute rather that, that we have, if, if you have that, that opportunity in, in a district, you say it's 12 counties uh, large, uh, talking to a lot of people, but to isolate it down into that single message for the single voter as he or she gets set to go to the ballot box in November, what's that message you would want to leave with well, them? 
we have, I believe, have done a good job of uh, turning the state around. But we aren't done. We aren't done yet, and I think we can do it. If we have the opportunity to serve four more years there, and uh, we bring back the right people to Lansing, uh, I believe that we can and will continue the recovery of the state of Michigan. We cannot go backwards. We have to go forward, and uh, so I would like to be a part of that. Well, we certainly appreciate your time. It's a busy campaign season, a lot of miles to cover, but for taking the time to talk to the voters about all these concerns, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us as well. We've been talking here on Meet the Candidates with State Senator Darwin Boer. He is the Republican Senator for Michigan's 35th District. He is seeking a re-election to a second term in that office. For all of us here, we encourage you to use your right to get out on vo and vote, place that vote on November 4th. This has been Meet the Candidates, a production of CMU Public Broadcasting. Both major party candidates were invited to participate in this series. For a complete listing of the air dates and times for this series, go to our website, wcmu.org.